Thank you very much, Gennaro, for inviting me to be here this semester and to work with you. It's very exciting for me because I do not normally work with architects. Also, from time to time, I get invited by architecture schools. Um, and thank you very much for uh, Matteo to introduce me and uh, to work with me on the course. Now, as Matteo already mentioned, in Gennaro, I'm an artist. Um, I live in Newcastle. I'm originally from Germany. Um, and I moved to Newcastle because of my university job. And I got stuck there since 17 years. And it's a very nice place to work and um, to have a base for my art practice, so to say. Um, I thought I'd probably connect um, the talk more to, towards the, uh, the course I'm teaching here. So there will be a lot of my students, hopefully, here. And uh, it's more directed to them. So what you see is only a part of my artistic practice, not everything. And also, Gennaro urged me to finish after 45 minutes. And I will be short, so don't worry. So you can move on to your other, other uh, lectures and other courses you have. Um, Obviously, or ideally, we would have a little bit of uh, question and answers afterwards, because I hope there will be a lot of questions from you about my practice. Um, but if it's really urgent and you don't understand anything I'm saying about a particular work, don't hesitate, raise your arm and, and interrupt me. I don't have a problem with that. So you can directly interfere and say, Wolfgang, what is this? Um, yes. So let's start with a little overview. I picked. Um, six artworks I would like to talk about and they're not in a chronological order because I think it, it, from a narrative point of view they kind of like uh, fit better together that way and I included uh, House Madrid which is an example from a project series I did called House Projects I did four of those um, and House Madrid was uh, one of them then I move on to a project I did in Milan in 2008 at Piazza Oberdan, Le Terme. Maybe some of you have seen it, maybe not. This is actually uh, when I met Gennaro for the first time because I asked for volunteers to help me with the project and I contacted um, the Politecnico and Gennaro was the first one who shouted out yes. So thanks to him, a couple of uh, architecture students worked on this project. So I think... Um, it's good to see this project. Then there's Res Publica, a project I did in Washington, which is slightly different. Cash point, transfer and transfer la bahn. And if we have the time, I doubt it, I will also talk about a different strand of my art practice, which is actually photography. Um, and then I might talk a little bit about Atlas as an ongoing project I do since 2009, where I record um, uh, urban public places in a very particular way. Okay, so um, let's start with House Madrid. Now, I will, what I will do is I will not talk so much about my intentions, what I do or why I do art. I probably talk more about the methodology I use or how I work and how I go about to realize my project because the methodology, how I do my work, is absolutely key into the understanding of the work. So I hope once you understand how I work and how the projects ev evolve and develop, you will probably get an idea what the work is actually about. Um, also, I probably talk a little bit about my interest as an artist. So again, I will avoid giving own interpretations of my work because I leave that up to you. So the first work is House Madrid. Um, I was invited as part of a public art festival uh, which coincides with the art fair in Madrid, um, Madrid Abierto, and that was the first one in 2004, to realize one of my so-called house projects, which are or is a series of temporary, time-based, and when I say time-based, you will hopefully understand soon what I mean by that, uh, artworks that are located in central urban public places. And I use building or architecture, probably not architecture, more building, as a methodology, as a process to do my artworks. So this is a computer-generated drawing to visualize the broad concept of it. Um, the House Projects is a series where I build temporarily um, like buildings which refer to um, dwellings 
It's, so it's for people live, you know, like flats. So the proportions are relating to that. But obviously it's just some, how do you say, um, a refer, referral to it. So I'm not designing any houses. I'm not, I have no interest in becoming an architect. So all I do, I use building as a language. I'm not designing anything. So this is what probably makes me completely different to you. I'm not interested in aesthetics. I'm more interested in what it means and what it can do. So what I did, what I proposed is I wanted to build two identical shells of houses that are overlapping and intersecting and in a very particular way. So that I built only a section of each house at one time deconstructed and reconstructed again. So what I end up is I have two different parts of these buildings which are, as I say, constructed and then when I have a corner, so each corner of these buildings, let's go back, so I'm always only building a corner of each of those buildings. So I have two corners going up, two corners coming down, and at the same time the next corner is going up. So what in effect is happening over the period of the two weeks when the project was on is I have two buildings dancing around each other. I hope that makes sense. It's like a Mexican wave in a football stadium. Walls go up and walls go down simultaneously. So why do I do that? I want to kind of like animate architecture or building, animate um, something which we usually perceive as something permanent. And by that, in a way, question our understanding of building, architecture, urban design, and also public place. For this project, I, I found this location, which is called Paseo de Ricoletos, um, which is right in the center of uh, Madrid. I don't know if anybody from you is from Madrid and knows this place. It connects a commuter train station and another subway station. And people come in the morning and see the building standing here. And they return from work in the evening. And five hours later, the building is over there. So something has changed. So it's constantly moving. And obviously, quite nicely, in Italy, uh, sorry, in, in, in Spain, we didn't have any fences, unlike England, where health and safety, I had to fence everything off. So people could really walk between the buildings during the project when I was building it, which was very nice. So here you see a few from above. So these two corners are constructed and then deconstructed. And also what was quite nice is that this is kind of marble floor, this beautiful listed marble floor, and then all of a sudden you have these kind of building works going up. Um, so who is my main audience? I have two different audiences. One is obviously the public who passes every day my work co coming back and forth and seeing it evolving, changing over the duration. At the beginning they think this is some sort of strange building site. Some people even don't understand that this is an art piece. They really think I'm building something there. I had questions, yeah. For the first project I did in Newcastle um, of this series, I built literally right in the middle of a public piazza in Newcastle, and people were coming asking me if they can buy a flat. <laughs> yeah, you can, but it's gone tomorrow. So, <laughs> so really people were not realizing that this is something different than a building site. But here it's pretty obvious because it's in the middle of this walkway. So um, the, as the building rises and goes down, I have the audience, obviously, of, um, of the public. And I have also a different audience. My second audience um, I'm very interested in is the builders themselves. And something very strange happens to the builders because the builders themselves, they build something up and have to take it down 10 minutes later. And that is something really strange for a builder. He never has done that before. Because they obviously perceive everything they do as something at least semi-permanent, let's say half, half a century that it lasts, their building. But they never actually deconstruct what they do. So again, another image. So it changes. So once this corner goes down, the other one goes up. So actually, those two buildings never touch. As I say, they kind of like dance around each other. Now, the builders I usually work in these kind of projects are, is, a, is a mixture between professionals and volunteers. Volunteers in that sense that they get paid, yes, but uh, there are usually trainees from building colleges 
or from universities. So they do that as part of their course. So they get trained um, in doing that. And they usually like really to take part in that because first they learn a new technique. And the technique I'm using here, especially the building technique, if you are from um, Spain or even from Belgium and, and, and Netherlands, you will probably know this kind of system. It's kind of breeze blocks, these white uh, cellar blocks. But the special thing about that is they click into each other. They don't use mortar. So I can put them up and I can take them down without having any waste. So everything is constantly recycled. So there is no waste at the end, <laughs> apart from a little bit from the foundation uh, where we have to put mortar down. So, um, and a lot of uh, building students don't know this technique, so they want to learn about it. So they, they come and volunteer to work with that. And also we work with the system scaffolding, which is also quite common, to, for example, here, Leha, where you kind of click the scaffolding into each other. Whilst in other countries where I do the project, this is not common. For, for example, the British still work with tube and fitting, so very kind of old-fashioned scaffolding. So they're very keen in getting involved in the project to learn these new techniques. So I, as I say, I have two different audiences apart from the fine art audience or the specialist audience, which is the public and the builders themselves. Now, another very interesting thing happens to the builders um, because they are performing the work. So they are at the front. People ask them, they don't ask me. They say, what are you doing here? And they have to defend it. So at the beginning, they start this as a thing where they learn maybe a new trade or a new skill. But by the time they grow to it, they take on ownership and they start to defend it. They try to make sense of it. They explain it in their own means. And that I find very, very interesting. Um, so they kind of start to interpret the work for themselves. And it becomes a part of their own work. So in that sense, I collaborate with um, the builders. It's like a little bit like I'm the director and the builders are the, the actors on the stage. So, and I did four of these type of projects and, um, and this is just an example of it. And then there's a second part. Do you have any questions about the methodology or is it all clear? Yep. Who pays for this? This is the usual question. Good one. Now, there's very little public money involved in that um, because usually I get the complaint in the newspapers, waste of public money. But there is no public money or very little involved. First of all, the blocks are very, very cheap. They cost hardly anything. If 500 euros, but usually the, the companies, they give it to me because you know building materials are cheap. So this is not a, an expense. The most expensive bit is actually the scaffolding because if you have to hire the scaffolding and if you do bigger projects, that costs quite a bit. But fortunately, I have a good relationship with some scaffolding companies and they give it to me for free. So I don't have to pay for the scaffolding. Now, obviously, I have to pay for some uh, of the builders and some volunteers are involved. So if you look at the scale of the project, it's actually quite cheap. So uh, in comparison to other art projects. Now, um, so this is, what I want to do with this work is also to provoke a discussion. Obviously, you squat kind of like a public place. People go through it. They complain, what is this? So I have a discussion starting with the audience, between the audience and the builders. But I have another discussion starting as well, which is, as you kind of like indicated, the newspapers, the public discussion in the media. Because immediately I get the response, waste of public money, what is this? And then people write back um, saying, this is fine, we, we are engaging with it. So there is really a, a, a very often a public discussion going on in the media as well. And uh, usually a starting point is the waste of money uh, discussion, I guess. But it's also quite interesting to find out that through this public discussion, you get also feedback and people start to rethink for themselves what architecture could be or what it is. So they realize the building does not necessarily is something permanent, uh, which I found quite interesting. I had people coming back to me saying, ah, at the beginning, this, I thought this is rubbish. But the more I see it, how it dances and changes, the more I engage with it and find it interesting. Now, a different aspect of my work is photography. Um, I also um, 
work a lot with photography and I also even studied photography at some point in my life. And from the beginning or from the outset of my temporary time-based, because they're changing projects, I was very much interested in how to document it adequately. How can I document a project like that? So it's not just still images of the walls going up and down, but in a different way that reveals something else. And then I thought I'd do a long exposure analog photograph, which is I built my own um, analog cameras, which is basically like, a, how do you say, plate cameras or large format cameras. And I installed them uh, securely on architecture, or in that case a tree, or you know some corners of, of, or lampposts where they can't really move. I opened the shutter at the beginning of the project. I expose the film, the analog film, for the duration of the project, in that case 10 days, and then I close the shutter. So what happens on the images, all the activity, everything that happens is burned onto the photographic plate, an analog photographic plate. And what that reveals is obviously the only view of the computed, completed building. So because when you're there doing the event, you only see a part of the building, but the photograph reveals uh, the completed building. And I like to show very much the, 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 the Madrid photographs. Why? Because I had the luck of 10 days of sunshine. So that means the building is evenly exposed. Because obviously the sun, the light, determines how, how the exposure on the plate is. Now you might wonder why there are no people on it. Because people move and they're not long enough there. So in order to show up on my camera, you would have probably need to stay still for at least three hours. And then you would be a ghostly image. So uh, this is why there are no people and no cars on the streets. And then you might wonder why is it at the top a bit more less exposed and more ghostly than at the bottom? Because obviously a wall is built from the bottom and take, take uh, to the top and then taken down the reverse way, which means the blocks at the top were there only for half the amount or even less than the one at the bottom. So the bottom ones are more exposed. Does it make sense? I hope it's clear. So the photography is the only, in a way, remaining part of my projects, which is also quite handy because I can sell them. But it's not the reason why I do the projects. Some people think I only do them because to get these wonderful photographs. No. This is a, how do you say, a different aspect of it. It's, it's, it belongs to the same work, but it's a different yeah, chapter of it, I guess. Okay, let's move on to the next work, which is Le Terme. So, Gallery Choca is a, is a commercial gallery um, near Piazza Oberdan, and I work with uh, Rosanna Choca, who is a gallerist. She asked me, Wolfgang, I would love you to do one of these house projects in Milan, and I will organize everything for you, and let's go and let's have a look around. Um, and I said, yeah, fine. But at that time, I wasn't really interested in doing again another one of these house projects. But she showed me around, and I found this kind of piazza, Piazza Obert. And I don't know if you know it. Probably some of you do. Um, and there's these kind of bookstores. And sometimes on a Saturday, there is market on there. And I found it really interesting. And the first thing which kind of stuck in my mind was, what is this strange thing? And that thing, there's these huge columns. What are they? I mean, this is clearly not architecture. It's clearly not a piece of art. And I was wondering why are on a piazza or a place like that these kind of strange objects? And then I found out that actually these are chimneys. Chimneys of a public bathhouse that sits underneath this piazza. So underneath here is um, Piazza Oberdan. It's uh, Domo di, whatever it's called. Forgot it. But there is um, Bagno is here. It's a public bathhouse from the Mussolini area, built in the late 1920s, where people go and have a shower or um, a bath. And, um, and it has been, how do you say, closed in the uh, 1980s, I think. So it's not being up for public anymore. So I was really curious to go in there. And I said, can I, can I go in there? Maybe I get inspired for a piece of work. 
And then um, the gallerist managed to speak to the city and try to get the key. And it took her two months to find out that the municipality of uh, Milan has lost the keys. <laughs> Great, no problem. They said, get a big bolt cutter and cut open the door, the, the lock. So this is what we did, and we put our own lock on, which is great. So then we, we walked underneath um, this piazza, and then we came in this kind of strange world of objects. There's these kind of marble bathrooms everywhere, and then there's this kind of... Uh, what is that? It's a hair cutter, I think, or whatever. So there are different shops in there. And it's all crumbling apart, and I felt like uh, Indiana Jones going in a tomb. And spiders everywhere. And we found this. So this is all lying underneath Piazza Oberdan. And I found it really exciting. Of course, I have to do something with this. So my idea, and then there was a little office, and I, of course, went into the office and looked around, and I found, amazingly enough, the original architectural drawings by the architect sign. Can you imagine? Lying in there, rotting away. So I took it, um, I scanned it, and then I sent it back to the municipale, how do you say to the municipale, and said, here, you, the original drawings of your wonderful bathhouse, you better keep that in your archive and not let them rot away. So this is basically the su um, subterranean um, drawing of the space underneath Piazza Oberdan. And then I tried to kind of pick out some architectural features from that in one-to-one. -one. I copied that. So I didn't want to rebuild the whole um, bath house, so just sections of it, and, um, and made my own drawing, a three-dimensional drawing. And I wanted to recreate it on top of Piazza Oberdan, but in a mirrored way. So the surface of the piazza is the mirror of the underlying architecture. So this is why everything is the other way around. So this would be the distance, how it's underneath, OK? Uh, that was my idea. And I wanted to use the same methodology as with the house projects before. That means I'm not going to build the whole thing, which is, by the way, 60 meters long. It's quite big. And, um, and this is five meter high. And this is about one and a half, two meters high. So the idea was that I built section, and the section runs along like a scan, OK? Um, and this is what I did. So I started with the kind of architecture here. And uh, this were already a part when we took it down and, and continued. So in, in effect, I didn't need a lot of blocks, because it was only a section wandering along. And I did not need a lot of uh, scaffolding. So the project took another two weeks, I think, or 12 days, where we kind of like run along this whole space and back again. And what was also quite nice that the shop owners were quite supportive. I mean, yeah, I was literally building into their shop nearly. Um, and at the beginning, they were nervous, but then they understood this is some crazy artist doing some funny thing, and they, they were happy with that. So this is another image. And this is, as I said before, how I met Gennaro, because I asked, do you have some volunteers who can help me with the project, who are interested in engaging? And I had a couple of students coming and really working on the side, carrying around the blocks and really engaging with the project, also communicating it to the audience. So here another image. Uh, so it wasn't too high. Yes, it was only that high, because quite underneath, immediately, the, the, um, the architecture started. So in the final image here, you see, we had to stop because there was this bookshop. We couldn't go any further. So the project took uh, two weeks and was recorded again with my black and white photographs. And I'll show you one of those. Now, the weather here was slightly different. So it's only partly exposed the walls in certain sections. But what is, I think, quite nice about this photograph, you can see the shutters of the bookshops going up and down, so you can have a, an x-ray view through the shutters, seeing the books in there. Um, here's another, another image. And you see here, again, when there was a good day with a lot of sun, the walls are really exposed. And when there was not so good day, you can see you hardly see anything, because it was underexposed during the light. 
And also you can see, like a spy camera, you know, this car never moved. Anyway. Um, if you're really interested in this project, there is a video documentary online because there is a, a cultural program, a video cultural TV program online called uh, Ultra Fragola. I don't know if you know that. And there is a 10, 15 minute interview with me in Italian and the documentation all in Italian on there. Ultra Fragola. At the end, I show a web link so you can write it down. So Ultra Fragola TV, and if you Google my name in there, then this film, so this little um, documentary movie on this project comes up. <coughs> so, as part of the project, I also tried out for the first time a different technique to record my, my artworks. And this has since then become a major part of my other practice, my photography practice. And this was the first test. I don't want to go too much in detail about the technical issues, what I did. Um, I just want to tell you that this is also a time recording of the project, but in a different way, where I record basically a tiny section of the project, but over a duration of time. So here, this is the first day, then there's a short night because I switched the camera off. There's the next day, night, next day. So this is actually a timeline going from left to right, where you can see the changes of the project. For example, here you see really there was something of the building exactly there and then there wasn't anything. So, and that was one of the results. Very abstracted image where you can kind of like guess that this is some sort of architectural space. Um, but what you actually see is only a line over time. But I, if you have time, I talk about this type of photography later. I'm already conscious that I'm running out of time. I have to be quick. <laughs> okay, next project, Respublica. Um, public art festival in, um, in Washington, D.C. I was invited as part of uh, a team, five artists chosen by five curators to do a, a public installation that lasts for six weeks, as, as I say, as a public art festival proposal. Now, when you come, I was the first time that I was in Washington, I never was there before, uh, what really strikes you, that you see all this power architecture, you know, this huge, wonderful Palladian-style temples, which uh, obviously represent all sorts of things. In that case, it's the... Uh, the, the Court of Justice, how do you say, Supreme Court of America, which is the Temple of Justice. Um, so you have this kind of Greek uh, architecture, Greek Roman style architecture, which represents democracy, whatever it does. Uh, and I found that quite interesting. And at the same time, really next to it, the other architecture you find is a lot of homeless people living in little shelters on cardboard boxes on the floor. And I was really struck by that how do you say, this huge diversity of architecture. So you have the kind of representational power architecture, and then you have the minimum shelter of a person for survival, which is a cardboard box. And I wanted to do a project about that. So a completely different project. My proposal was to um, build this little newspaper vending machine, uh, which is very common in USA. Uh, especially where the property prices or areas where the properties are quite nice. You see these little newspaper boxes where you can take free leaflets. and They usually look like little houses because they are from estate agents, uh, magazines where you can look up houses or whatever. So I redesigned one of those in, in, in stainless steel um, using Palladian principles, uh, copying in a way behind the, the uh, Supreme Court. And I mean, just a little anecdote, when I was doing that, these black cars were always driving around me, taking pictures and filming. So I'm on all CIA and FBI files because <laughs> it's probably a bomb in there. It's really, it, was, it took the curators a long, long time to convince the government agency that we can put that there, that there's no bomb in there. So, um, so what was in this uh, little thing? You see there's a lot of leaflets inside was basically a, a construction manual. People could take and build something on their own. Um, so people can take it for free. So here's a spy shot of myself of people taking something out. And inside was a, 
construction manual how to build um, the Supreme Court in 1 to 50 scale out of found cardboard boxes. So if you want, if you want to do it, you can download it from my website and you can have a go and build it. So it's all the measurements and how you do it. It's like, a, as I say, it's two-folded. It's a big poster like that. Um, and it explains how you do This is the end result, how you do that. Um, and the idea was that during the project, people would hopefully build it and put it in the public somewhere. That was my dream. Obviously, I knew that only very few people will actually build it. So I worked with the local art school, and they built six for me. Um, or we built it as a workshop together, following the instructions. And then we had various sites where we put them throughout um, Washington. And actually, this is a photograph which I downloaded from the web. So it's not from me, because lots of people photographed it and put it on Instagram and whatever, the social media. So I tried to find images of my work from them. And this is in front of a Jewish center. They do a lot for homeless people. So this is why I, um, they really agreed to have it there in front of their doors. And this is a Jewish wedding, and the wedding guests photographed this, which I found quite nice. Now, obviously, the link for me was clear. I kind of juxtapose or combine this, as I say, this, this architecture of homeless people in terms of the size of the material they use, not anything else, with this kind of um, representational architecture. And by that kind of like questioning it. And at the same time, I knew that over the duration of the project, the Temple of Justice would crumble away, of course. I mean, it would kind of rain and it would kind of deteriorate. So the part of the deterioration was also part of the concept of the work. And, uh, and some, some of these architectures lasted for the whole duration, six weeks. Others survived only for a couple of days. People destroyed it. Um, but um, I think it raised a lot of debate about how we treat our homeless. And so it was quite interesting for me. And here's another image um, I found on the web. People used it to do their own artworks out of it. So free parking, and they put lots of cars in. Obviously, uh, or here free, the little frogs. So you find funny things people do with your work, which I kind of like. So they engage it and take it on, make something different out of it. OK, that was um, Res Publica, you know, public course, I guess. The next work is something different in the sense that usually my work is from a temporary time-based nature. It changes. It's only there temporarily and disappears again. But sometimes as a sculptor, as an artist, you get invited to do permanent public commissions, which is great because you get paid to do a proposal. And this is why you usually do it. You're sometimes not interested in winning, but you want to get at least some money to do a nice proposal and so on. And um, Sunderland is a small city near Newcastle, and the public art officer invited me, Wolfgang, we really like your work. Do you want to put in a proposal to enhance a public place in Sunderland? And this is a public place in Sunderland. And the proposal was a typical, typical uh, public art proposal is um, we have a very bad place, which architects and town planners completely messed up, we want the artist to come in, to rescue it in some form, to reactivate it with wonderful art, make, a, how do you say, not a monument, to make something, a landmark. This really was saying in the brief, landmark art piece, you know, landmark art piece. Fine. And it should cost nothing. So the budget was 30,000 euros, which is nothing for permanent public art, because the foundation itself costs probably half of it. Anyway, so I was a bit cross. I, I, I hated the whole idea to do something for that. This is really like a, a, a dead end of a road, and it's between a parking garage and a casino. But they call it a public place, and it's part of, yes, a pedestrian area. Nobody ever goes there. So they wanted the art to rescue it, that people go there and, and do something with it. So, and then I thought, well, I do a proposal, like, you know, I made a public sculpture, like, like you see so many, like a bit of street furniture. And then I thought, oh, this is so crap. This is, I don't like it at all. Uh, I put in a second proposal. So the first proposal was 
to fulfill the brief so I can get the money. Because if you don't fulfill the brief, they wouldn't give you the money. So the second proposal I put in when I was at the interview, I said, well, this is my proposal, but I have a second proposal I would like to introduce to you. And if you like it, it would be great if you do that, because I really think that's better. I'm proposing to you a cash point. It's very cheap. It fulfills all your criteria. It will raise a lot of awareness. It will be a landmark. It will go through all the media, and lots of people will be there. And they go, oh, well, how do you do that? I say, very simple. I make a little hole in the wall up there, this little box. And behind is a little machine which drops a five-pound note every 24 hours randomly onto the street. <laughs> it's called Cash Point. It's very cheap. It costs per year 1,500 or something uh, uh, pounds. Not a lot. The machina itself, the machine itself, I calculate it costs about 5,000 pounds so I can make a hole. So I would have enough money to run this thing for 20 years. And I would even get a little fee out of it. And you can be assured that people hopefully would go there in order to get maybe five pounds. And so I activate the place with a kind of financial incentive. At the same time, you're pretty sure that the media will write about it like crazy. You know, municipale wasting public money, throwing it out of the window. <laughs> so that actually the images you see are the images of my presentation to the panel. So this is the original images. So I make this kind of mock-up of a person catching money. And the idea was, if it's up in the air, the wind can blow it away, and it's not people don't try to get it out. It's just up there. You can't reach it. And I won the competition. <laughs> the curators loved it. They say it is a great idea. It's brilliant. We have to do this. But we have to be very sensible. We have to kind of change it a bit. And so we had a long discussion. And then, in the process of developing the artwork, I decided a little hole in the wall is maybe enough to tell the story, but it would be better if there's also kind of like visually a bit more to see. So I decided that I copy a real cash point, but move it up, uh, up in the wall. So you see now the final piece, which is a, an abstracted cash point where the money just drops out. I mean, the interesting thing is usually the cash point controls you. You type in and it gives you the money. Uh, you control the cash point. You type in your number and it gives you the money when you want it. But in that case, it's the other way around. It, the cash point decides when to give you the money. So um, the development of the work took half a year, year. We had discussions with the municipal and everything. And at the end, nearly for the install, installation, it was censored. The, the mayor said, we cannot do this. This is too hot. This is too much. I will cost me too much voters. We're not doing this. So it was politically censored work. I mean, I don't think that would ever happen, but so it never realized in real. Um, however, I still made the work because I thought it's a brilliant piece of work. And um, it's now shown sometimes in public art festivals for limited duration, which I don't really like because the idea is that it's permanently installed. Why? For me, it's not so much about provoking a debate about our economy and about uh, um, public money spending, but it's also about creating a myth, a myth about a place. So, in effect, when you have installed this machine, I could just stop making the money come out because it's already in the public, the story that this is the place where you can potentially find the money. So, and I really like that idea that with, um, with activating a space like that, creating a story about the space, uh, you can change the space. Um, in Munich, for example, I'm sure in, in, in Milan you have the same thing. There are some public uh, sculptures or whatever. In Munich, we have a little lion head on a wall of the residency of the kings. When you wrap your hand there, it brings you luck. So it's a Polish kind of nose, whatever. So there's a myth, an urban myth. You go there, you wrap your hand, and you're lucky. And I wanted the same thing to happen in, in, in this kind of place. You go there, you may be lucky and find a fiver. So it's more about the story it tells and, obviously, the questioning of the public place itself. Can we, by putting in a financial incentive, which is actually if you think about it, pretty tough. Uh, make the people divert their flow in the, in the urban. Will they make a detour in the morning when they jog and to check if they find a fiver? Or 
Will it be, or will, I mean, that was the main argument from them against it. Oh, all the homeless people will camp underneath it. I mean, for a fiver a day, I mean, you sit in the corner, you get probably that money in half an hour. Do you know what I mean? So, well, so that's about cash point. I know, I'm sorry, I need to rush. Um, that was, was an occasion when it was shown. No, I don't think so. But no, but what I'm doing, I'm provoking. It's a provocation in a sense. Do you know what I mean? It's not. I'm not making. Indirectly, I might make a comment on that, but I'm not. As I say, I'm not interested in interpreting my own work. I'm sure you do it better than me, but I'm, I can tell you what I'm interested in. As an artist, I'm interested in kind of questioning public place, and by doing that, you certainly do because you really open up a big box about economy, about what the city's role is. What, what is the role of public money? For example, this was public money, and I gave it back to the public. What better thing to do with public money? And they think I'm wasting it. No, I give it direct back to the public. And they have a good day. I make everybody, one day I make one person happy. Finds a fiver, has an ice cream. Great, I had a brilliant day because I found a fiver. So actually, I do a lot for my money, you know, for 1,500 pounds in a year, I make 300 and whatever, 65 people happy. It's uh, to run a public light costs more than running my machine. Do you know what I mean? It's just also about thinking, what do we spend our money on? Why do we spend it? And it's obviously a provocational gesture. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, aware of that, but this is what I want to do. I want to provoke a discussion. And it certainly had a big discussion, I can tell you. Okay, next project is uh, transfer. Uh, that was before the cash point. Um, Milton Keynes Gallery, which is um, a public funded gallery um, in Milton Keynes, which is a suburbia, how do you say, a commuter city constructed in the 1950s. Um, modernist architecture on a grid system. So it's a quite exciting and interesting place. Very futuristic. Um, and the gallery there asked me to do a project. Um, and I immediately was, how do you say, fascinated by the architecture of the place itself. It's only pink, by the way, because Michael Craig Martin had a show there as an artist who made a mural. So it's not always pink, but when I took the photograph. And my proposal was, because the situation in Milton Keynes is a very strange one. The town center, unlike a lot of nice Italian cities like Siena or whatever, don't have a big piazza. Milton Keynes has a big shopping mall. This is their main town center, it's a shopping mall. And within the shopping mall is like an empty space, a big public square with a roof on top. And this is their town center. It's a commercial space. And the cultural space, which is represented by the museum, and behind is the theater, they are on the periphery of the town center. So the whole city has been designed with commerce and uh, um, um, uh, in mind, and the culture is basically pushed out onto the periphery. So my proposal was, so I rebuilt the whole museum as an event, similar to my house projects going up and down, but right in the middle of the shopping mall. Because the public space is big enough that this would fit in, which is nine meters high, which is quite big, and 18 by 18 meters long. And it took us, because this is the only public place, apart from the place in front of the station they have, it took us two years to kind of negotiate. And by the end, unfortunately, because it's privately owned, it's not a public place, it's actually a privately owned space, the owner said, no, we can't do that. Um, although at the beginning he was very keen, but then he realized I would block Burger King and I would kind of like, so they were not happy, but this is what I wanted to do. Anyway, so the, the methodology again was the same, building up and taking it down. So in one week, one of these walls, freestanding walls would be built up, nine meter by 18 meters. And over the weekend, they wouldn't move it would be like this kind of minimalistic art piece, uh, geometric art piece standing there as a big sculpture. Next day, they would disappear, and it goes up again. And when we realized we can't do it in the shopping mall, the curators found the second 
the most important place is the piazza in front of the train station. Um, and we could do it there, outdoors. So this is how it looked. So what I physically did, I took a copy of the museum and placed it onto a public square. So I transformed the public square into a cultural one rather than a, a commercial one. Usually, it's, as I say, defined by commerce or other things than culture. And I did that in two ways. One way is by physically putting a museum there. And secondly, obviously, through the event itself. Is my time over or what? Or, oh, oh, I will be very quick now. OK, you see, again, I worked with students. We did this kind of big project. And it lasted for three weeks. And a huge debate started about the public place in Milton Keynes. So we had public discussions with the town planners, with the museum directors. What do we do with this space? Blah, blah. So it was raising, as I say, again, raising the debate around this space. And um, that was the black and white photograph. And very quickly, I think it take only five minutes. Is that OK? With the final piece, which is, I use that, uh, tell you that because it is 10 years after I did this project last year, I was invited to redo the project in London. Um, and I called it Transfer Laban. So I got the money given to say this was such an important project to redo it in London, find a public place. And there are no public places in London that not belong to the Queen. It's very hard to negotiate with her to do something like that. So uh, I couldn't do it on Trafalgar Square. But there is um, in Canary Wharf, the financial district of uh, London, you may know, there are open public places. But they're not public. They belong to the Canary Wharf um, PLC, uh, to the company who owns all the buildings there. And my proposal was, again, to transfer a cultural building onto this kind of financial place, you know, the banking piazza, to squat this place, to occupy it, um, to block it with my intervention. And I used, or I found this building, which you may know. Um, it is by Herzog de Moron, the Trinity Laban Center for Dance. Um, so it's a contemporary dance center. It's also university. So all the, the best top dancers are trained in there. And it's a very important building. I, I think it won even the Pulitzer Prize in 2004 or whenever it was done. Um, and uh, I thought it was perfect for me because it has a very geometrical structure, the windows, so I could really easily transfer that into my, my, um, my methodology of building and unbuilding. And at the same time, I was very much interested in the dancers themselves because what I actually do is I make the building dance, and it's a building of dancers, so I thought it would be nice if the dancers would engage with the dance of the building in some form. So these are some dancers I worked with, and I worked with a very well-known British choreographer, and we developed together a performance which went alongside my building project. So this is the square, which is one of the biggest squares in Canary Wharf, which we could have, and, we, and I proposed to do a part of the facade because the original facade was too big. I couldn't fit it on, so a part of it. And the way I did it was I start with section one on the first day, then I build down, next one, next one. So these are the days when it kind of moved along. So again, so these are the kind of how it runs along. And this is how it looked. Obviously, my main audience in that case were the people occupying all the office spaces, which are a lot of rich bankers. And we made a film with that. We um, had the dance performances. You see here some of the dancers. It was like a flash mob. They were all dressed as bankers. They would walk on. And then they would kind of react and improvise with the building. And it was really very funny. And people was like, oh my god. And then later, they, later they kind of uh, waited for the times because they knew the times. They looked it up when the performance was happening. And at the end, we had kind of nice crowds of people watching the performances. So the idea was that, again, um, the building communicates with the dancers. Um, and, uh, and as I said, we filmed everything. And we are currently making a film installation out of that. 
um, which then will be screened. As, uh, this was actually part of the Architecture Festival 2016 in London. And this year, 2017, at the same piazza will be the film. So you can see the film of the project. So you see some few more images of these different kind of shapes moving along. Again, I did some recordings with my black and white camera, the same before. And finally, I want to show you a tiny little bit of one day of time-lapse footage of how the walls kind of moved. So these are all my few websites of my work. This is the overarching one, and some of the projects I did have own websites. And the ultrafragola.com is the one where you can see a documentation on the letter. Thank you very much. <laughs>